Hi, good evening. I am Isadora Rangel, Florida Today's Engagement Editor. And tonight we're going to have a very difficult but also much needed discussion tonight about racism, police brutality in America, especially in the aftermath of the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. And tonight I'm going to be joined by three Melbourne High graduates, for those, both, for those Bulldogs out there. And even before uh, we, we decided to do this live stream, they were doing their own thing. They have a Facebook page and a Facebook show called We Are Not Okay. So they have been having these discussions among themselves and their peers. And now I'm gonna start, try to pick their brains a little bit about solutions moving forward, how we can solve the, the issue of police brutality, racism and race relations in America. And I am going to introduce them to you now. They are David Jones, Jason Davis and Ty Hunt. Welcome, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Hey, how you doing? Thank Thanks you for, for having, having us. us. Thank you for having us. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I'm really excited. I actually watched a, a little bit of your show um, last night on Facebook. And by the way, if you're interested in, in learning more about them, I believe we have shared the link to their page in our comments. So go ahead and make, check them out and uh, interact with them. They're more than, than willing to interact with you, I'm sure. So I want to know, where does the idea of we're not OK come from? And this started just two weeks ago, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we um. So it's a group of us who are uh, all friends, and we decided to get on. I think actually Ty had this idea for us to get on and start doing a show where we talk about comic book movies, just ranking them, um, just real, you know, nerdy stuff. And uh, uh, after uh, the incident with George Lloyd took place, we were doing our Tuesday show and said, you know, hey, maybe we should just get on tomorrow and talk about what's happening. And if anybody wants to join us, you know, please do so. And it, it kind of just took off from there, really. And tell us, you know, how do you, what are you thinking right now? You're seeing such, I think we're live, going through such a historic moment in, in America and in the world, by the way, there are protests happening in other parts of the world. I, I'm from Brazil and there are even protests in Brazil about this. Do you feel the momentum is different or is there a part of you that thinks the same thing will happen that happened after Trayvon, after Ferguson, after Baltimore, where there's a lot of commotion and then things don't change? How are you feeling right now? What, what, what's, what's on your mind? I think it's a little bit of both, honestly. I feel like, you know, people are, are fed up, people are angry, people are distraught and they're trying to find an outlet. And, and so they're just, they're lost and they're trying to figure out what to do. Um, I think that the the the, uh, the the conversations that we're having right now, and also the the impact that we're having, is is good. But I am fearful that you know we're going to get to a peak, and then the conversation is going to die out. And so that's one of the reasons why David and Jason and I um, we decided to have these conversations so that the conversation doesn't die out. We we really attack what's going on and really focus on how we can actually make a difference. Okay, sorry. I, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, JD. Yeah, let me let me jump in on here. So, you know, I feel like the momentum is continuing to build. So, you know, just from you know some personal experiences, like you know Friday, I think, uh, you know, I just hit a breaking point, and you know, I I went live. I shared a a Facebook video about why I wasn't okay, and you know how all of these things were affecting me personally. And what I can tell you is I've gotten nothing but a huge outpour of love and support. And like the conversations that I've been having have been absolutely amazing. People actually coming to me and saying, hey, look, I don't feel comfortable having this conversation with another person of color, but I do feel comfortable having that conversation with you and admitting to me that like they've had their blinders up. Uh, they've kind of ignored it because it hasn't affected anyone that they know. And now that they see that, you know, it, it affects me, uh, it affects other people that they love. Now they want to speak up. And, you know, the amount of allies that I just see on Facebook right now that are just, you know, in this fight for good and trying to help people understand their microaggressions, their racial biases. Um, it's beautiful. Um, so I've had, you know, uh, absolutely amazing experience uh, with this, even though I had an emotional break and like, you know, I was just I just went Facebook Live today just, you know, thanking, thanking all of my allies out there and, and really telling them, hey, you know, 
this is a very heavy burden. And, you know, some of them are starting to get exposed to this burden themselves and they're exhausted. They're, they're reaching out and they're saying, I don't know how you live with this every day. So I kind of told him a little story uh, that my, my cousin told me this morning where, you know, he asked my grandfather, you know, years ago, you know, how, how did y'all live with like not having air conditioning and like being in house and it's just hot all the time in Florida. And he said, you can't miss what you never had. And, you know, it was, it allowed me to be able to explain to them, like we're born into this burden. So that's how we're able to, to do this, to handle this, but you do reach a breaking point at some point. And like, I'll, I'll openly admit, I've been really vulnerable through this process that mine was Friday. So, you know, after spending the day, just like, you know, trying to shield my kids, you know, from my pain, because I'm still trying to preserve their innocence, you know, I, it just put me on a mission to, you know, want to change the world for the better, because I don't feel any child should ever have to carry this burden. Yeah, you, 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 you brought up a term that I hear a lot, and I, I want all of you to explain what you, what do you think that means, which is allies. What does that mean? And I think perhaps white people see it differently than you do. So explain what that means for, for people who might be interested in, in being allies or maybe consider themselves as such. I think, you know, I mean, and this is just, just my opinion, but like an ally is just somebody who's down for the cause, but in the way that they can show up. Um, I don't think an ally means that you have to be on the front line marching. Um, it could be reaching out to your local politician and asking them like, hey, what are you doing about this? How do you feel about this? We have uh, people in this community uh, that need our help. What's your perspective and holding them accountable? Um, so like, it's just, you know, I think if you try to define it as an ally, you have to do X, Y, and Z. I think that's a miss. If you're somebody who is interested in helping, um, especially during this moment, black and brown people, because we have been having these injustices happen to us for so long, uh, that's what makes you an ally. You're ready to actually commit and say there is a problem and I'm willing to do something about it. Jason and Ty, do you, what's your take? Um, I think that an ally is somebody that is willing to sacrifice. You know, this is not going to be a comfortable journey for anybody that decides to, you know, take up the flag and be like, hey, we got to fix this. Um, but they got to be willing to, to sacrifice and say, hey, enough is enough. And um, it's somebody that just wants to, to be, um, be with us. I think that's the, the easiest way I can say it. Um, because like I said, this journey is not something that is for the faint of heart, somebody that is, is strong-willed and somebody that's willing to put their neck out on the line for us um, just because it's going to take more than just people that look like me and David and, and Jason. It's going to take everybody that um, feels as strongly as we do about it. And so let, let's talk a little about um, law enforcement. And before we started the live stream, David and I were talking about some of the experiences that you have had. I want, I want to explain what it's like, what was it like for you growing up in Brevard and just being you know, black men in America and what, what does law enforcement represent in your communities and has it changed as you got an older and you know just give us your your take on, on this very complicated topic law enforcement man you know it's um it's interesting like my, my father works in law enforcement out in california um and so we have very very long and interesting conversations but growing up um i did have uh quite often run-ins with law enforcement uh good kid but i got pulled over quite often i've been told to get out the car uh, at gunpoint before, I've been told to get on the ground, and uh, I've also been told I fit the description. It's not an uncommon story for um, young black men in this country. Uh, but at the time, I honestly just, as much as I hated it, I just thought that that was acceptable because it was just consistent, um, and I didn't know any better. So as an adult, um, those things stick with you. Uh, and I can tell you, in my, in my area, uh, I, I work with local law enforcement here. They're absolutely amazing individuals. Um, but when these things happen to you when you're young, they, they stick with you. There's a certain uh, traumatic effect that happens. And so I still know anywhere I'm at that when I get pulled over, I have a set of rules and, and a set of things that I have to do. Um, in this past week, uh, I believe it was Tuesday, uh, I was just sitting in the car, went to go get food, didn't feel like 
driving around anymore, waiting for the food to get done. Uh, so I parked in the movie theater and was just chilling in the car, not thinking anything of it. And when I looked up, a police car was behind me and the lights went on. And I got to tell you, it's one of the most scariest moments uh, that we go through, and especially for myself. It's one of the most scariest moments of, of that that I've that, that's happened with me. Um, I looked around. There were no cameras. There was nobody to witness anything. It was an empty parking lot. And I was by myself. And my first thought was, this is it. Oh, my God. Like, who do I call so they can hear at least if something happens to me? Uh, and I, th I thought about my mom and I was like, I don't want to do that because if something happens, I don't want her. I don't want that to be the last thing she hears. And so I didn't call anybody. Uh, and, and let me tell you, the police officer was absolutely spot on. Just said, hey, it's weird. There's a car over here. It's closed. Um, they did exactly what they were supposed to do. There was nothing wrong with the interaction at all. Uh, extraordinarily nice gentleman, checked the ID, came back, you know, said, have a great day. I said, thank you very much. Um, and then when my heart finally slowed down and, and, and that anxiety went away, um, one of the first things that I had that, that I did was I, I created an email account um, and, and told my brother, hey, I'm going to send this for you. Uh, send this to you with a uh, password and I've been sending pictures and writing letters to my daughter because if anything happens to me she's only four so I guess said hey I don't know if anything can happen to me at any moment um, and it feels like that's elevated because I'm a young black man in this country so I just want to make sure that like if something does happen that she can remember me um, for who I am and not just like stories about me and I don't think anybody should have to do that but those are the things that we have to think about. Like we don't, we don't get the pleasure of thinking when the police get behind us, it's all good. It's just, it doesn't work that way. Jason and Ty, do you, would you, do you want to say something about yeah, this? Yeah, sure. Um, so listen, the first thing like I want to establish, cause I think you got to say, cause you got to diffuse the, the situation that happens is listen, I don't think all cops are bad. It is, you know, a small few. And I think if you think about any industry that's out there, like even at your job, you probably know a couple people that you work with. They're like, mm, I really don't enjoy them. They're not good people. Right. Like that's just that's a thing. So I think that's the first thing you have to establish. But even with that, when you see the images that you see on TV, you can't you can't not get um, a lot of anxiety when you get pulled over. So I, I will tell you, I've been very fortunate that I have been pulled over a lot. I have been pulled over driving while black or, you know, your tail lights out, but your tail light really not out when you, you finally stop and check it after the encounter's over. Um, but I've never had, you know, I've never had handcuffs put on me. Um, I've never, I've, I've never had a gun in my face, uh, but I've had had a lot of encounters. I have been pulled over a lot. And, you know, it, it forces me, like even from a very young age to try to live a life of perfection. So you try to do everything perfectly. You try not to speed. You try not to do uh, break laws. You try to do everything perfectly so you can minimize the amount of encounters that you're going to have with the police. Because, you know, my encounters have all been, you know, pretty decent. I, you know, you always want to have somebody who's had a bad day, but no one's done anything where it made me feel like, uh, okay, this is going to be the end. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that, you know, when you're African American in America, you know, you're going to have encounters and one of those encounters could be your last. And that just stays very you know prevalent in my mind. So like, I try everything I can to, to minimize them. Cause even if you live a, a life of perfection, unfortunately, you're not going to eliminate them. You're just going to minimize them because you are African American. Wow. And, you know, we're all pushing for change. Um, however, getting to, what's the road to changing? What are some of the tangible things that you think we can change in law enforcement, but also in, in society in general? You know, what are is there a low hanging fruit and how can we make how can we affect that change? I think okay. one of the easiest things that we can do is have a conversation. Um, because being able to see a person's humanity takes away everything else. You know, one of the things that uh, we all spoke about was going to like a rock concert, for example, a place where we aren't typically seen a lot of, right? Um, but I personally like rock music. And so, you know, when you see somebody that's like, hey, what are you doing here? You have a conversation with them and then you can, you know, find a way that you can connect with them in a way that you didn't necessarily um, think of before. And so, 
for me, that's the, uh, that's the easiest way. Just have a, co a conversation with me, um, have a conversation with my peers and, you know, just, just talk to me because I'm a human being with, with, with feelings and, and goals and stuff like that, just like anybody else. And when people see that versus just what I look like, you know, that opens up a whole lot more um, conversation that, that can lead to a lot better things. That's very good. I agree. You know, it, it's it's how we got started, um, even with with the we are not OK uh, conversation that we've been having. And it's uh, it started because we were talking about things where people said typically they don't see people that look like us have these type of conversations. And so we were like, hey, man, I mean, we we nerd out. Uh, we we typically <laughs> uh, get deep into to Marvel, into DC, whether you're talking about comics or movies. Um, and it was it was fun because we found people joining us like, hey, this is awesome. Like we, we want to be a part of this. Um, and then in that moment of just finding unique ways to come together, it humanizes everybody that's a part of the conversation. Because like, I mean, unlike Ty, who doesn't like good movies. What are you um, talking about, man? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> uh, unlike Ty, movie choices does, are amazing. If you, if you ever if you if you ever watch our Tuesday nerd show, this what we don't have a name for it, but that's just what we call it. Uh, you'll learn quickly that Ty is usually wrong. But <laughs> um, um, but what happens is, and what Ty said is very real, is, is is that people become to humanize each other once you find more commonalities with each other. Um, and the more conversations that we can do, that the more times that we can um, find different ways for us to come together, not just about commonality, but also the appreciation of differences um and that word is important because it's not about the acceptance of differences it's about the appreciation of differences because saying i accept you because you're different it's like i guess i gotta accept you because you're something different but there's a different feeling when you appreciate and embrace other differences like that's that's where the healing begins because then we start to see each other as um as as people and it's okay to see me as a black man because i identify as a black man like i don't want you to tell me you don't see my color uh, because then you're not seeing a part of me um but appreciate, you know, me just like I'm going to appreciate you. I'm going to appreciate everybody else. Uh, Isadora, I appreciate that you are a strong female. <laughs> um, I won't ask. I don't, I don't see gender. That's like a weird thing to say, right? <laughs> it's like, I don't see that you're a female. That doesn't make any sense. And you and you hear that that type of uh, commentary when people are, are talking about people of color. They're like, well, I don't see color. And I'm like, OK, well, I do. <laughs> it's there. Like, don't don't pretend to not see me. Uh, see all of us for who we are. We're unique individuals, just like you're a unique individual. And let's come together and celebrate that. I think it's so interesting what you said, that color blindness argument that I hear a lot. And it's always bothered me. And it's just like you said, can you explain why that is so wrong? And actually doesn't really help change things. I think it's actually makes the problem worse because at least, and I don't know if you guys agree, it stops people from having the discussions that you say are so crucial. The, I think the colorblind conversation is a misguided attempt on trying to heal. And so it's because we've uh, looked at you and, and we've almost damned you for being the color of your skin. Uh, instead of saying we're going to fix, you know, how we treated you because of it, we're just going to say, hey, that was wrong and we're not going to see color anymore. And there, there might have been a good intent <laughs> of, hey, we want to go into healing, but I just think it was misguided because you can't erase a part of me just so that you can accept me. You know, yeah. you either accept all of me um, or you don't. Wow. So, Isra, I want to jump in here real quick. So yeah, go ahead. I, I was looking at a comment and it, and it kind of stood out to me and it's from uh, Mitch. And he was basically saying that, you know, he grew up in the 60s and 70s and he got harassed a lot because he had long hair. Right. So, Mitch, I feel you on that. So, like when I when I think about like what can we do to help? Well, the first thing is we should be able to approach everything with love, dignity and respect. OK. And we got to understand these biases and, you know, whether they're racial or just biases that are out there, they're, they're biases like. Mitch got harassed a lot because he had long hair and they thought, you know, he was, you know, either selling or doing drugs. That's a bias. Um, you know, so as we have these conversations and we start talking more um, about these biases and understanding how these microaggressions that we say kind of shape people's perspectives, that's when we get better. Like I have, you know, had an amazing opportunity to connect with a classmate that we haven't talked in 20 years. And it's really, 
you know, every one of our chats are all around just like love and understanding. So be completely, be completely honest with me on how you're feeling and, and, and what you're thinking, because I'm not going to like lash out at you because you say something that might be, uh, you know, ignorant or um, insensitive. Like, I want to teach you why it is from our perspective so we can get a true understanding because I'm more than just, you know, what you see on the outside. There is so much more to me beneath. It's the, it's the saying they say we're like icebergs. You know, you're only getting a piece of us from what you see up top. Most of our mass, most of our death of who we are as people is below. Like, I love the Foo Fighters. They're a great band. I love a lot of other uh, rock bands. I also listen to, uh, you know, R&B and a lot of rap. But, you know, we make assumptions based off of one, racial biases and what people look like instead of just having a, a real life conversation and getting to know people. And I think as, as soon as we start thinking about love, dignity and respect, I'm telling you, this world's going to be an amazing place. And that's what I'm in this for. Wow, that's... That's really good. Um, so to on the topic of change, um, and I want to I want to go a little deeper into the law enforcement aspect. Not saying that that's the only institution that requires change. I'm part of another institution that has that also needs a lot of change when it comes to that. You know, journalism is not 100 percent perfect. So not to single out law enforcement, but we sort of have to. I was listening to something on the radio and it was a discussion with, it was a couple of experts in law enforcement and they were talking, is it an issue of training in law enforcement? Is it an issue of just culture in law enforcement? Is it lack of diversity in hiring? What are some of the things that you feel that law enforcement could could change in, and that are really perhaps the root of the issue here? So just, you know, and even in conversation with local law enforcement, one, you know, I've, you've, I've already seen what some of that change looks like, and everybody has seen it. When you look at the images of uh, the police kneeling in front of the protesters, the police having conversations with the protesters, them dapping it up, they're, them really being um, uh, showcasing themselves as, as a togetherness, as a brotherhood that's outside of um, the, the police officer's outfit and the skin of another person, but just individuals coming together so that they can learn how to uh, operate together. And um, I, I look at the local law enforcement here in Rivard. You see, uh, I, I believe it's next Thursday, uh, Melbourne PD uh, is having a, uh, a town hall or a gathering to where the community is going to come in and we're going to sit down and there's going to be a conversation. Um, uh, I've seen it from other local law enforcement is putting out statements that they that they stand with people. And I think that's what you need to see. And then the actions that go forward are then what's next. It's if we're going to come together and have a good conversation, what happens next? Like there has to be some type of this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're all going to hold each other accountable to make sure that that's going to come to fruition. Um, I don't know what that is, but I, I can't wait to hear and see what those conversations breed so that we can come up with uh, what those steps are to get to the place that we need to be. Because uh, I, I was joking around uh, with a colleague at work and I said, hey, man, like I want to call the police, too. Like if I'm in trouble, like I don't want to call the police and be like, oh, I wonder if they think I'm going to be, you know, if, if I'm the perp or if I'm the victim. Like I, I um uh, uh, I, I don't want to have that feeling. So I think this conversations amongst each other and, and the coming together that you're seeing, uh, there is still some bad apples. Uh, and, and I think Chris Rock said it best, like, like that, that job is like pilots. You can't have bad apples in it. Like everybody needs to be really good at their job. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that's the other part that it's just, I can't wait to see happen. And that's when there are bad apples, they get weeded out by the police, not by, other people because uh, yeah that that's a way that it can happen but when police really will police themselves and remove the bad apples uh, that's i think when you're going to see true trust come from the public especially um uh, or potentially from black america and at least from my perspective see for me that's one of the things that um i have an issue with like i see all of the uh police kneeling down doing all this stuff you know for the the media and stuff like that but personally i don't trust it because you know the spotlight is on them right now and so 
I'm always the kind of person like, what do you do when nobody's looking? That's what I care about. Um, because we were talking about, um, you know, will this conversation last after the protests end and stuff like that? And for me, I want to see that kind of stuff happen just on a daily basis. I don't, I don't, I don't want to see it just because everybody's looking at you and, you know, what are you going to do? Like, I've gotten a bunch of emails from all the different companies that I, you know, have signed up for and stuff like that. And it's like, we support you, we do this and that, but it's in response to this. You know, I don't want to <laughs> feel like you're just saying that because, yeah, yay, you know, go you, you know. <laughs> but then, you know, when the thing is over, it's like, okay, moving on. <laughs> and that's what I feel like right now. Okay. Well, so that question, uh, Isadora, is, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of a difficult one, but if y'all are willing to bear with me, I'm going to attempt to <laughs> answer it, but say something pretty radical. Okay. So the first thing is like, I empathize with police officers because you have to think about what their job is. You also have to think about the amount of bad stuff that they see. And that all causes trauma, right? And it engages our fight or flight response. And like, I empathize with the things that they go through. With that being said, we know that there are some bad apples in the group. And I feel like, and this is where my radical thought comes in, like that job has so much honor because you have a shield, right? You're here to protect and serve. Like, I believe they should get paid significantly more money than uh, what they make. Like, I legitimately feel like they should make the same amount of money as the veteran minimum for an NFL player. That's how much I feel they should make because it should be a job that so many people aspire to want that there's mm -hmm. so many applications that they can literally pick the best people because it is that honorable of a job. And there are other roles in our private sector that I believe are the same way too, like teachers and firemen, yeah. et cetera. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, like police officers, because of a couple bad apples, they all get kind of grouped into the same thing. Same thing with black people sometimes. So like, see how it works both ways. So even though like, like I respect them so much and I think it's a very honorable job and like my little brother's a police officer and I love him with everything in me, you still have that fear because think about what you see. So like that would be my change. And again, like it's, it's really radical and I know that, but like, that's how I feel. I feel like they should make so much and that it's, it's such a desirable role that so many people apply that they literally can pick the best people. You know what's crazy, JD? I don't feel that, I don't think that's radical at all. That seems like perfect common sense to me. You know, so just the fact that you say it's radical, I think that's part of the problem. Because well, like I say it's radical because think about the amount of people that say teachers make too much. Think about the amount of people that say this makes too much. I, I, it was <laughs> too long ago that like they were talking about raising pay for uh, teachers in Bavaria County. And I look on a Facebook post and people are like, they're going to make this much money and they're going to get three months off a year. Like <laughs> they're gonna say the same thing for police officers. Well, so that's what? Why I say it's why, you, like, it's why would you not want that, though? I mean, but exactly. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that makes sense. that's the point that I'm making. I Anybody who thinks that's teachers are getting, happens. if anybody who's thinking most teachers are taking three months off a year, have no idea what they're actually doing. You're right. I, I have to believe that that should be happening, but uh, you know, but, like but Jason, it was right. J Jason, we've had this conversation, and and, uh, and I've stood by the stance that um, that the job doesn't pay enough, so you're not getting the qualified applicants that you would want if it paid more. But it's that that's only a piece of the conversation. Uh, the what it takes to become a police officer, the time it takes to become a police officer, the psychological exam is not the same across the country. In some states, it's really difficult. In some states, it's super easy. It's a problem. The, the background checks, there needs to be so much more that goes into the background checking, the, the, the training, and not just the tactical training, but the emotional intelligence training, um, uh, uh, just this leadership training. And, and, and I mean that because if you are an officer of the law, you are a leader in that community. That, that is a decision that you are making when you put on that badge uh, mm -hmm. because you have authority. Uh, and, and I don't, and, and, and quite frankly, I can tell you this, I don't know if they go through leadership type training um, to, to be able to assess the situation from a different perspective outside of just the tactical um, and, and de-escalate. Uh, there's there's people there, there there's human beings that you're dealing with so there needs to be a little bit more human training that comes with this job 
Yeah. And uh, by the way, it's just if you are just joining us, by the way, we're getting a lot of hearts, according to our digital producer, Jennifer Sangalang. So great. If you're just joining us and wondering what we're doing here, I'm going to reintroduce our guests. They're David Jones, Jason Davis and Ty Hunt and, and look them up. They have a Facebook page and show called We Are Not OK. I assume the best way to find them. And I believe we have a link to their Facebook group. Jennifer, if you can please repulse it in the comment section, you can also just do a search for them. There are different pages with the same name, but theirs is a page and not a group. If you understand the difference, like their page and follow their show. Um, and I'm really enjoying this conversation, but I want to make sure that you can keep up this conversation with them later on. And uh, can, can I just say to something to Cindy in the comments? Yeah. Cindy, I, you know that I, I got to tell you, I don't think you're really wrong there. I do believe that if if lawsuits had to come out of uh, police officers' pensions, we'd probably see a lot less lawsuits. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Because um, uh, you know, we talk about uh, officers really uh, having the ability to police themselves. Uh, almost in any profession in life, if it has to do with messing with your money, things tend to change a little bit. So, <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, let's be real. I agree, with Cindy. Cindy, I agree with you. And it's interesting, the conversation about rooting out bad apples. I know it's easier. It sounds it's a lot harder to do because you have unions that get involved. My boyfriend, I mean, for full disclosure, is a deputy. And one of the things that he said is like, how about we do the polygraph part portion of being hired? We need to go through a polygraph test. Why not ask them questions about racism? So I don't know if that's a. what do you think about that? I know the poly, polygraphs are not perfect science, but is that something that that makes sense? I mean, this is coming from this is completely just. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I, I think it's a great. I think it's a. I think it's a step forward in the right direction. Uh, you know, it's just is 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 if because I think it just changes depending on where you're at as far as like what it takes to be a police officer. And quite frankly, there needs to be the highest of standards. It should be one of the hardest jobs that you that you can ever uh, uh, get. Um, yeah, we should and, have a combine for uh, for the yeah, police officer. <laughs> yeah, like, like the, so the NFL combine, we just make it for. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the old police academy movies. They, 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 they used to seem like they had a combine, but like, uh, but I don't know. Like, it's just now. It's just we we need uh, to work on who they are here because, like, I think that's where the issue is. Uh, there needs to be like, a, who is this person on the inside? Yeah. Um, and it's not just we. As long as you could pass this 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 physical, uh, uh, this physically grueling job, then we'll give you a badge. Like there needs to be more about who they are here and who they are here. Yeah, and I, I want to talk about the protests that we're seeing. Uh, a lot of peaceful protests, but also we've seen some violence from protesters as well as law enforcement. In Atlanta, I believe six officers were fired. Mm -hmm. What do you make of all of this? and the use of violence from, from both sides. And we can First, start talking about protests or we can talk about the police, whoever. I'm gonna start this one off. So like, first thing, I don't condone the violence. Um, it actually, I, it, it's actually one of the things that kind of led to my emotional break. Like I'm literally watching the television and I'm watching a place, uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, where, you know, it's like a, a second home to me. Uh, I spent a lot of time there because my, uh, my company is based out of there. And I'm literally watching like that city on fire. And that, that absolutely broke my heart. But there's so many reports um, that's out there that there are, there's a group that's out there that's inciting uh, this violence and these riots. Like the amount of pallets of red bricks that are just randomly showing up places like Miami where they don't even use bricks to you know, build houses uh, is insane. So I think like there's a, a lot of aspects there. Do I wish uh, none of the violence happened? Absolutely. Like I, I, I am definitely all on a journey of peace and love, um, and, and like really having a great conversation through through understanding. So it it hurts me to see that, but I don't think this just sparked because you know protesters went out and said, "Man, I just want to tear some stuff up because I'm just angry." I think uh, people tapped into their rage people tap into their fear. And then there was a group that knew that all you had to do was light a match and the explosion would happen. And that's uh -huh. what you see happen. And there's, there's, 
Facebook live videos, there's pictures, there's posts, there's been um, multiple um, police outlets that have confirmed that uh, there were outsiders that were kind of uh, inciting riots. I was talking to a friend that uh, lives in DC. He said when he was on protest, there's people that are like infiltrating the group, they're wearing Black Lives Matter shirts, but they're telling people, hey, you know, you know, I'm with you. I want to give you, you know, $500 to go damage this. Like these things are actually happening out there. And I think uh, I think that it, it takes away from the message, you know, like like JD said, I don't condone any of the looting, any of the writing, any of the uh, like the vandalism and stuff like that, because that paints the wrong picture. You know, you want to make people see you in a different light. Why are you doing all that stuff that has nothing to do with the whole point of the, the protest in the first place? And so I want to see like when, it, when we see all the stuff that's happening on the news with the protests and, and, and that sort of thing, I want to see it get back to the actual message, because that for me is getting lost and we can't do that. Yeah, yeah, it's because it's so muddied as far as who's in started, like who's inciting the actual right and the looting aspect of it versus who's not. It, it's, it's hard to have a conversation around, you know, how you feel, because it's it like you heard from JD and you're like, hey, I don't feel good about it because it feels like there's other people doing it. And even if you're tied, it's like, but even if it's not them, I don't like it. And so it's kind of hard to have that conversation. Uh, what I will say is, I think it's it's I think the conversation is too loud. Um, there's too much focus and attention on it because, and that strays away from the important conversation. And that's uh, we watched a man get murdered, and the murderer that did it posed for eight minutes and some change on camera with no remorse and no fear because. In his mind, he has a privilege that was going to protect him. Um, and that's what this that's what incited this rage and this pain and this 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 anger for people to want to come out and voice their opinion and do something about it to see the change. And, and if we get distracted from that, uh, then we lose this this momentum and this ability to see the world actually make a change because the world is with us right now. Like if you take a look everywhere else, uh, I, what feels different about this uh, and I, and I am cautiously optimistic that maybe this is like the, this, this is the time where change will happen. Like, I mean, we've seen this happen before somebody gets unjustly murdered, people are outraged. And then the next shiny thing comes and people walk away from it. And those of us who identify with the people who are getting murdered are looking around like where y'all at? Uh, but this feels different. Like if you just take a look at what's happening around the world and how people are uniting in Paris and in London and um, just in all these other countries, and even inside this country, um, we can't lose sight and focus of what's important and what we're fighting for. And that's systematic change of the treatment uh, of black and brown people in this country. Uh, I think somebody said it earlier, like, uh, and, I, and I've seen this stated, like, you have a few bad apples that are police officers, but that shouldn't ruin it for everybody. Well, you've got a few bad riots that are out there, but that shouldn't take away and ruin this whole ex this whole movement for everything. It's, that's true. So, like the the whole purpose of people getting involved in this is to diminish the power of the protests. Like, let's think about some of the things that we have seen on the positive side. I mean, literally, citizens and police officers doing a Cuban shuffle together. I mean, that happened 20 minutes away from my house yesterday in downtown Newark, Ohio. I've heard reports of that happened in Seattle and Newark, New Jersey, like all over the place. Like that's the, the beauty in this. The Amish and the Mennites have come out in solidarity right beside the Wiccans. Like it's um, a really beautiful thing to see. Like the world is protesting and the world is protesting peacefully. Are people on edge? Absolutely. Has some violence happened? It surely has. But it's about controlling the, the rhetoric and the narrative. And if we can get everybody to follow the smoke and mirrors, right? Like, look over here, all this bad stuff happening. It takes us away from, you know, the mission. And the mission 
is getting like equality and equity out there for all people. So I know like black and brown people stay at the, uh, the, the center of this is because it happened directly to them. But we also have to remember that we still have the LGBT community. We have the Latinx community. We still have kids in cages at the border. Like there's a lot of issues and even Asian Americans and how they've been treated with COVID-19. So there is a, a ton of issues there, but it's all about like, love, dignity, and respect. And if we can get there together, I personally feel like we are we have a lot of momentum going because of so much solidarity that we actually are going to, to get, get this change. And it's not gonna happen overnight. Like I can definitely admit to that, but like everything that I see, the conversations that I've had, like, you know, you still have some, you know, people that are out there that are just inherently negative, but I see so many people that were silent. And that's the important part. There are so many people that were silent because it didn't affect them. And now they're seeing, like they're having a change of heart. They want to speak out, they want to help. And I've seen some amazing allies out there. And I think an ally is a person that has nothing but love in their heart and they wanna make this world better. So they're gonna speak up for you on your behalf because they know that you can't do it alone. And we need their voices to make that happen. So JD, I'm about to contradict myself for a second because I said earlier that you know conversation is something that really makes a difference. But quite frankly, I'm tired of the conversation that we that we've been having for you know the past decades, centuries, whatever you want to call it. You know, while I, again I'm not inciting violence, I think that you know just talking about it and you know saying hey we need to fix this, we need to fix this that brings awareness to it, sure. But it, it does one of those things where it comes up and then it comes back down. We we care about it, we're angry, and then everything dies back down and then until the next tragedy happens. And for me, I'm personally tired of talking about that. You know, I don't know what the action is, um, but I definitely feel like there definitely needs to be some kind of action um, to, to fix it because for me, the system is broken and it's not gonna be something that we can just, you know, fix because we're all coming together. It's gotta be something that, that I don't know, it just, there needs to be some like, some kind of action that just makes the change whether it's, you know, completely dismantling the system and starting over, I don't know. But, you know, quite frankly, I'm just, like I said, I'm just tired of, of, of just talking and, you know, being mad and being, and seeing the injustice and saying, hey, we got to come together um, because we've, we've been there, done that. We got the t-shirt. Now, it's, you know, what's the next thing? Ty, I don't, I don't agree. I, I don't disagree with you. I know, you know, we've had this conversation um, offline, online, um, you know, and it's and it's interesting because you you see and we'll, we'll, we'll use yesterday for example like we didn't do our show because there was a blackout and we wanted to respect that but like we still were trying to look up like what is the blackout about uh because we didn't know and it kind of felt like hey this is going to happen but i don't know who was prepared for that to happen so it feels like there's action um but we don't understand the plan and we don't understand what the outcome is that we're trying to get to and we need tangible outcomes um and, and and we need it to come from different uh, avenues. Like we need people to fight in different ways. Uh, if protesting is your thing and you want to go out there and do it, that's one hundred percent fine. If 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 calling your your local politician, you know, uh, you know, vote the people out that aren't going to try to have justice for all. Bring the people in that genuinely show that they truly care uh, about all communities, but in particular, right now, black communities, because this is the community right now that uh, that's on fire and it needs help. Um, and, and, and find the truth because, uh, it, it's hard, you know, media is, 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 as I said, it's not perfect. Um, and it can be strewed like in so many different ways, but we have the social media platforms to allow people who are actually out there, speak the truth and show you what's happening, show you what's actually existing. Like when they're out there on the front lines or if they're talking to somebody, um, bringing guest people on on any type of platform like this to say, hey, what's the reality of the situation and what are the true outcomes we can have? And then start local. At the, the part that kills me is it always feels like we're waiting for some giant national solve that's just going to be this miracle pill that we take and the country is healed. Um, it doesn't work that way. You have to start local. Like what's going on in your city? What's going, what's going on with, with your local city government? What's going on? Uh, with your county government, like what are the, the 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 policies and procedures that they're putting in place to make sure that these things don't happen, um, that communities can continue to strive and, and and become more one than just you know divided as 
hey, you might not like me because of the color of my skin or whatever that is. So uh, I don't know. I, I, there's not a magic pill, but I do think that we I think that there's actions that we can take if it starts locally. Uh, and you oh, bring up a very good point about people don't pay attention to their county commission, to their city council. Um, Congress is great. The White House is important, but the people in your communities have the greatest impact on your life. So vote, which, and I'm sorry to cut you off, Jason, but maybe you can answer this question. I want you to pull out your crystal balls here for a second and tell me, do you think this will motivate people to vote in November? We know that voter apathy is such a big issue. Do you think this will, if you, if you, if you could see in your crystal ball, how will, how would this impact the November elections? All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer uh, that question <laughs> with a question. So something that uh, just came to me um, like a couple days ago as I was talking to a peer was two questions. And the two questions that you know I, I like to ask people is, uh, do you feel uncomfortable with everything that's going on, and do you uh, do you feel uh, do you have fear? Like so, do you feel comfortable? Are you are you scared? And um, my full 100% belief is if you can say yes to those two questions, you feel uncomfortable and you feel scared, then I would say to you, welcome to being an uh, African-American in the United States of America. And the fact that you feel that way should make you want to change. So with what I see on Facebook with the riots and the protest and, and people really actually, you know, not feeling good about it, really feeling scared, like if you feel that way, then you're obligated to change it. So no human being, okay, ever feels that way again. So I think it will help if the conversations continue. But if it just dies down, I think we go back to out of sight, out of mind, and that's what we do as human beings, and then we'll move through it. I'm trying to personally keep the conversation going because I think we have an amazing amount of momentum, and I think that momentum matters. All right, we're about to wrap up here. I'll give Ty and David uh, maybe a minute each to maybe address my question or to give any any final thoughts. Um, I'm on the opposite side. I don't think voting is going to work um, just because personally, I'm very cynical in that situation. I had a conversation with my buddy, Bobby. He works in the political forum and you know we've, we've spoken a lot about this. Um, I think that there's so much corruption. Again, I, I say, you know, we got to break the system because the system's broken. And so um, for me, there's too much corruption in the voting polls and, and how that whole system works. And so um, I have personally never felt like my vote mattered. And that's sad to say, but that's just how I feel. Um, I wish that it could, it could be a thing where we all had a voice. Um, but I asked my uncle this one time, I was like, what would happen if nobody voted like all the choices that we have are bad like personally i think the election that we have coming up is is horrible just like it was in 2016 and i don't know who to vote for because everybody sucks um and so i asked him like hey what happened what would happen if everybody decided i'm not gonna vote and he was like well the system that we have you know somebody's still gonna be chosen and for me that was like well that's a bad thing how is that gonna be a thing how are you saying that my vote matters if that's the case and so with this i know i'm going off on a little bit of a tangent but with with you know, solving these issues, I don't think voting is just enough. Um, Sure, it'll help if that makes you feel better, but personally, I don't think that it's gonna be enough to to get the change that we want. Um, So I I would tell you that I be entire full disagreement, uh, but we've had this conversation as well, Um, which is usually, like I said, on our other show that we do, Ty is wrong. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, I think that um, voting is extraordinarily important. I think that when you go out and you vote for the president and then you sit back and you say, cool, I've done my job, I think it's it's very misguided. If you don't know about the people who are running locally and what they stand for and what they will do, not what they say they'll do, uh, but what they will do, and you try to hold them accountable, then you are participating um, in, in a right that we definitely should all exercise. Uh, people have fought and died for the right for people to be able to vote in this country. So I, I truly believe that we got to exercise that right, but we got to get smart about how we have to exercise that right. And it's not just about voting for people. It's about voting for policies. Um, 
and truly understanding and knowing how your voice has power. But if you don't understand what you're voting for, if you're only voting for a name or a party, then you're absolutely truly just, you know, you're, you're, you're checking the box to say, yeah, I'm going to do it because I'm just going to check the box. You really need to understand who you're voting for. You need to understand the policies that you're voting for. Um, and and I tell you, I'd say you got to go past party. At this absolutely. point in time, you have to take a look and say, who genuinely <laughs> like, like really cares about people? Um, and, and the conversation might be more than other, more than the other one. Uh, and, and vote your heart because at, at this point, I, I do believe it's going to make a difference. I think that we saw it made a difference today. I saw in the comments. Um, I think yeah, Drea said that she saw the protests uh, already helped voting. The lines of voting were wrapped. Uh, the, the lines for voting were wrapped around the corners in D.C. and in other places. Um, mm -hmm. So and, and that makes me happy. Like like it's showcasing that the people's voices are being heard uh, and they're tired of of the way things are and we want to see a change and we're going to put people in place to make that change but after you vote if you disappear then don't get mad with what happens like ty what i will tell you this voting matters if you stay involved but if you vote and then you just turn around and say okay you got this i hope you do good and you don't pay attention for four years then yes yeah, so <laughs> like so vote but then definitely stay involved uh because i'm telling you we can make a change and i think we're seeing that right now yeah, and I think the biggest thing to realize too, I just want to make a quick point is like, I think the two party system is something that continues to divide us. And we continue, like, we have so many things that divide us. Absolutely. Like, at the end of the day, like everybody out there, look at me, okay? We are Americans, okay? We're not Republicans, we're not Democrats, we're Americans, right? We're human beings first, we're Americans second. And I think if you, you take a look at who is the candidate that best represents my ideals, like you're gonna vote the right way. Like on my voter registration card, I'm a Democrat. I'll tell you how I chose that. I went to the driver's license place and the person told me, oh, you're black, you're a Democrat. I was like, all right, cool. Um, and, 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 and like, that's what I've been the whole time. But have I voted for Republicans? Absolutely, I vote for the person that best represents my ideals. I wish we would change the voter registration card to have a checkbox that says American, because that's what I am, I'm an American. I'm an American. Absolutely. That's great. And votes. I agree with all of you. I think voting matters. And by the way, Florida City will be having forums during local elections so you can be more informed. They're coming up in July. And also coming up Saturday, uh, Florida Today is dedicating uh, a big portion of our paper to voices and Brevard's Black community. So make sure you watch, you, you watch that. Make sure you, you, you read that. By the way, David is writing a guest column for us. And I haven't edited, but after hearing what he said, I think it's going to be awesome. So make sure you, you read his column and make sure you look them up on Facebook. We are not OK. And, and follow them and engage with them. And I want to thank you all for participating in this. Um, we're going this is we've been going live for 53 minutes and it feels like it was only 15. So <laughs> you guys, thank you so much for sharing your your insights with Florida today. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. We're, thank and, you. And, and we go live, believe it or not, an hour or so. <laughs> okay, so go after, now if you're, go, you have time to grab a snack or dinner and watch them. And, uh, and the conversation continues. Yeah, our, our conversation tonight is about uh, privilege and how it's been weaponized and also about the celebrity uh, responses that we've been seeing, good or bad. Uh, out in the media. So it should be an oh. interesting conversation. Yeah. Yeah. That's We're going to have fun tonight. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And thank you for sticking with us uh, and go to floridatoday.com for more news and have a good night. Thank you. Good night.